You are listening to ABLE Radio, simplifying productivity for small business owners everywhere. If you are looking for 1% improvements that add up to big results, this is the place for you. Every week, we learn about simple systems and tools that will help you build the business and life you've always wanted. Now here's your host, Zachary Sexton. Brooks, welcome to Able Radio. Actually, I don't even think you knew the name of my new podcast. It's called Able Business Radio, helping you be more able in business and in life. And I want to thank you so much for coming on for just a little bit of background. And I, I would love for you to expound on what I, I say here in a moment. Um, we're old buddies. Uh, we met, I think, over three years ago at World Domination Summit in Portland, which is That's pretty right. close to where you live. You're a little far north in, in Canadaville in uh, Vancouver, <laughs> which I was just there not two weeks ago. Beautiful, beautiful city. I had never, uh, well, I take that back. I'd been when I was 11. Just drove through okay. going to, uh, to Whistler, but I was just impressed. And I'm not sure where has more cranes, uh, Vancouver, <laughs> Denver, which I also lived, or Austin, where I live now. It's just all three of those cities are, are, are blowing up these days. Um, but how we met was at, at this conference where at the time, you still are running a blog on I'm going paperless. It's called Document Snap. And you've taken all of your knowledge over the collective years of being obsessed with this problem and you put it on a blog. You've got a number of, of little courses, that a number that I've taken, and it all surrounds the problem of, of taking an analog world and turning it digital so it's a little bit safer, so it's faster, so it's more effective, more efficient. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about over the next 20 or so minutes is setting up a paperless system. So thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing that knowledge. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's hard to believe it was that long ago that we met, but uh, yeah, it really was. I know, I know. And then in person, we haven't met all that many times, but we're just like always tweeting at each other and uh, pinging back and forth. And now you're on a team that I was just on over at Asian Efficiency, which is a great online productivity blog. So it's pretty cool. It's just our worlds collide a lot. Um, That's right. I'm, I'm the new Zach. It's a total downgrade, but you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing my best. <laughs> Much smarter, a little bit more handsome, uh, <laughs> a little bit calmer, maybe. So the, yeah, the new, the new Zach. And I, I haven't listened, but I've downloaded a couple of the podcasts you're on on, on the, the old podcast that I hosted, The Productivity Show. So I'm excited to still learn vicariously through you that way. Um, and I, you know what I want you to tell again is your story of how you got into um, writing about this topic. It was nine years ago, and you had a move. Before that, you're a, you, are you still a CPA, or do you ever lose that designation? Uh, no, I still am. The, the okay. CPA in Canada is a little different than in the U.S., but same same general concept. Um, yeah, so I was working at a software company, a financial software company, and I was running their support department and, and helping people use our software. And at the time, my wife and I were moving. So we were moving from a big old house into a much smaller townhouse. We, did, we were going through this big simplification phase. And as I was moving... I was packing the, my big heavy file cabinet bulging with paper and, and I just thought this is ridiculous. I, I don't need, you know, 90% of this paper. Uh, so I decided then I was going to go paperless and I really had no idea what that meant, but I just, I had heard the word. So I thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So I wanted to do things in a, you know, being a bit of a, a software geek, I guess I'd say I wanted to do things in a, a very automated, efficient way. And I, there's bits of, information all over the place. But uh, there wasn't any one central place that had the kind of information I was looking for. So I decided to start the blog, just writing about my experience and how I was doing things, and the things I was learning as I was doing it. So this was kind of going on, but it was just a, a hobby, you know, I would, I would go downtown at say, uh, 630 in the morning, hang out at a Starbucks, write write the blog, build the site, and then at eight o'clock, go to my job. And, you, you know, it was, it was kind of a side thing that I was doing as a hobby. But more and more people were discovering it. And I was getting lots of questions. And we had a nice little community in the in the comments. And then I had decided to leave my job, uh, just for 
totally unrelated reasons. But as I was leaving, people started asking me, hey, Brooks, uh, do you, you know, sell any information that can just help me do this? Or, or do you, do you, you know, help people do this stuff directly? So I didn't at the time, but of course I said, yeah, of course I do. <laughs> and that's how that kind of phase of document snap uh, changed and it's been going ever since. So, yeah. And you said you didn't even know what paperless meant at the time. What does paperless mean to you? Well, at the time, my goal, my goals were a lot different at the time. At the time, my goals were to get rid of the paper that I don't need. So it was for me, my extent to, of going paperless was just scanning. You know, I want to take paper, scan it and get rid of as much of it as I can. Over time, though, I felt that a bigger benefit has been around productivity. Actually, it, it's almost flipped for me. So instead of the goal being for me to get rid of my paper, uh, which I've, you know, I mean, I'm not a monk, I'm not a hundred percent paperless, but you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's on the way. But for me, the biggest benefit has been on the back end of having, being able to find information, having whatever document that I need, if I need to look up something, you know, you just tap a few keys and I have that, that digital copy right up there in front of me from wherever I am. So that's been the biggest benefit for me, the accessing information. Oh, okay, okay. And so you, you're talking about taking these physical things that you understand. So it's 2008, so it wasn't like the beginning of the internet or anything, but it was probably, yep. there's not as many tools, especially in the software department, uh, that there are now to make this process much easier. So it's probably why everyone was loving your blog, because you were figuring it out the hard way and then <laughs> explaining it very simply to them. But when you have a piece of paper, I mean, you, you have it. It's there. It's like, you know, it's physical. It's tangible. Um, I, I know, you know, as long as I put it in the right place that it'll be there when I want it. Can you talk about some of that's one of the fears of going paperless, even though there's some efficiencies and, and uh, less clutter. If you're talking about being um, being minimalist, that's we actually I was just talked to Courtney Carver of be less with more the other day. And, and that's that's a big why behind uh, taking a lot of your physical papers and, and turning them digital. Um, but can you address those fears of not being able to find or um, or maybe completely losing some of the, the stuff that you scan in there? Yeah. Um, well, on the on the 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 topic of, you know, you have a piece of paper, you have it, it you know, you've got it right there. Just the other day, actually, I had some notes that I had jotted down on a piece of paper and I had forgotten to put it in my backpack. And then I was working from a co-working space and I went to get it and they weren't there. And I was like, no, why didn't I do this digitally? <laughs> if, it, if it was digitally, I could have had it from anywhere. But because, you know, that piece of paper is on my desk and not where I am, uh, I had the actual opposite problem. Um, but as far as, you know, allaying the fears around digital is concerned, Really, I, I find that that is that fear is lessened if you approach things with a systems mentality. So what I mean by that is you're capturing this paper, however you capture it. I'm sure we're going to talk about that. And you store it in a organized system that you create and you have things backed up and protected so that, you know, if something happens to that digital copy, you are able to access it through your backup. And if you have that systemized system set up, then that really reduces the, the risk of losing something. What are some things, before we get into it, because you do have a, a nice system for collecting and then organizing and then protecting, which is what I want to spend most of our time talking on, but you got to get the why sometimes. So you, you wanted to reduce some of the clutter um, later you found that it was some of the efficiencies. I, I had somebody on recently where we were talking about a, another tool I, I believe you enjoyed called 1Password, and it's a, a mm. password manager. And it's sometimes difficult, even though after the project's done, the, uh, the benefits are so clear and so enormous. But before the project, you really need to have a, a good-ass reason why. Because it's going to be a little bit of work. It's going to be a project. It's going to be some. It's not something that anybody's forcing you to do. There's no deadline to this project. Is there anything that you found? Any sort of message that you found that when you say it to people, they're like, "Oh, yeah, 
I'm, I should turn this should into I, I really must <laughs> do this in my life or is it kind of like, are you are you just like oh, whatever you know go paperless or not I just show you how to do it <laughs> um well for me it is a personal decision and what I mean by that is I usually am not somebody who as strange as this is going to sound I'm not usually somebody who does go around telling people you should go paperless because I find that people have different like you said different levels of comfort and there's almost like a point where they feel comfortable or they don't uh but for me the benefits of not having this bulging heavy file cabinet and not having papers all over the place. And I've talked to people, you know, my problems were not that big of a problem. It was more of that. I thought to myself, if I ever move again, I do not want to have to go through, through this. Right. I didn't have a huge paper problem. I have to admit, but many of my readers, uh, and customers really have had boxes and boxes of paper all over the place. Um, I was reading this, a uh, book, a really good book actually called It's All Too Much by Peter Walsh. And it's mostly about our attachment to stuff. And he helped, he told this story in the book about how, and I'm probably going to mess up the details, but the general concepts, right, that uh, he was t- working with a couple and their, it was something like their, their nine-year-old daughter had never had a meal at their table because it, the table had been stacked with paper essentially her whole life. And so they've never, you know, actually sat down together as a family, not in front of the TV. And that's just an, it, that's just an example. But that is what a lot of people have found a lot of success with is getting rid of this paper that the problem with paper, too, is you're right that if you have it in your hand, um, you know, it's there, it's physical. Right. But the other problem is if you do have a quote unquote paper problem, you're seeing that everywhere and it's stressing a lot of people. It's stressing them the heck out it's seeing these piles of paper all over the place. So that's what a lot of people have found helpful. Nice. And I'm actually, I'm in my office right now and I'm, I'm looking at my paper workflow and I'm realizing a, a new tip that I just wanted to share before we get into all of your suggestions. If you're feeling the, the worry about, Ooh, am I really, you know, if I scan this, am I going to find this again? Is this going to be all right? This has helped me. So I've got my inbox where I have my papers that I have not processed yet. And then in the middle, I have my computers and and whatnot. And then at the end, on the right-hand side, I have this box full of paper that I will eventually recycle. But I I scan what needs to be scanned. I I toss what just doesn't need to be tossed or I tear up if, if there's any personal information on there. But it goes in that box. And that box has been sitting there for about two months. So I know I've got the last two months worth of stuff. If I really need to find a receipt that I missed in my uh, in my budgeting software, my my uh, accounting software, I can go back and find it. And it really allayed the fe- the fear that I would miss out on that paper. And then after two three months, it's like okay, haven't needed it yet. Boom, you know it's going to go, and then start the process over again. So that there we go. I didn't realize I had that fear until I realized yeah. that's why I, I created that system. When I, I believe it was just some random organization. Actually, I'll put it in the show notes. It was Organizing Your House for ADHD or something to that effect. But it was a really mm. good book. If it, nice. it just makes everything a little bit more simple around your house. And it, and it helped us out as far yeah, as and organization that, goes. That does remind me of something that I probably should have said a long time ago. Is People have this concept of the word paperless, meaning getting rid of all your paper. But really just because you scan something doesn't necessarily mean you have to shred it. Mm. There's a lot of paper that, first of all, you should keep, you know, stuff around your mortgage and, you know, just those type of official documents. Obviously, you're not going to shred all that stuff. But if you have some paper and you don't want to get rid of it for whatever reason, it it has sentimental value or something, or a lot of people um, don't feel comfortable getting rid of anything related to taxes or something Mm -hmm. like that. There's still benefit in scanning it, digitizing it, organizing it, having it searchable, having it backed up, all that sort of stuff. But there's no rule that says just because you scan something, you have to you have to shred it or get rid of it. You can always file it away and still have it. Um, So for me, paperless isn't the total absence of paper. It's just being kind of more intentional about the paper that you're using and the paper that you're keeping. That's all. That's what it means to me. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I was just 
like I said, I went to Canada, so I needed a passport for that these days. <laughs> Surprisingly, yeah. they let me back in. It was actually uh, Trump's inauguration day when I was flying there. I was like, oh, so many people said they were going to do it. I actually did. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Canada. Um, but uh, politics aside, I in case I missed anything, any piece of uh, documentation that I needed to get in and out of the country, I would be covered because I've scanned my passport. I've scanned my social security card. I've scanned my um, my preferred traveler's card. And that actually came in handy because I had my preferred traveler's card, which I don't keep with me because I didn't think you needed to. I just thought you needed the number on your plane ticket. Mm -hmm. um, but I was able to get in a faster line because I was able to pull it up on Evernote real quick. Like, yeah, see, look, I'm the, fa I'm, 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 better than everybody else because I did this paperwork. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. And I would absolutely not throw out those cards because they're important pieces of, of physical documentation that you need, but having them in a digital form is also has its benefits too. So, well, let's awesome. talk about this. I, I would love to, from a perspective of somebody who is, is a novice in this area, they, they might have some of their things scanned in, but uh, if they do, it's, they're sitting on some folder, they don't know where it is, or it's not organized, there's no naming conventions. Um, can we walk through the, the three steps that you suggest? The collect, the organized, and um, and then the protect, and one, two, three, and just mm -hmm. give me give me a brain dump on me. <laughs> As many tips uh, and suggestions that you can to get people started and tools we can point them to, um, and, and even trainings, even if they're your trainings, um, actually, preferably if they're your trainings, because I know, um, I, it, I don't know if you still sell it. I hope you do. This Hazel training that I bought for $10 just changed my world. Uh, we'll talk about what that is in a minute. But um, so, so let's hear it. The, your, your game, whatever reason why you've, you've found, you want to start collecting. How do we do that? Sure. Yeah. So, so it kind of starts with, okay, you have some you have some paper and you want to take it digital. You want to make it electronic. So how do you do that? The most common way that, that most of us think of doing that is with a scanner. And so a lot of times we have scanners that are built into our all-in-ones or maybe we have a flatbed scanner or something like that. And those will definitely do the job. But if you have a lot of paper, uh, you know, on a regular basis or maybe a big backup, pro uh, you know, back project, you may find it helpful to invest in a actual document scanner. So it's a, it's a, a device that's actually made for scanning these things. And there's all sorts of different types and sizes of scanners that work. Uh, Doxy makes a good scanner, a good small little scanner. Uh, there's uh, Doxy Go and Doxy Q is a brand new one that I just reviewed a couple of days ago or a couple of weeks ago, I should say. Uh, the one I, and I do actually use a doxy sometimes the the scanners I tend to use the most are called the scan snap by Fujitsu and I've been using those since that was my uh, first scanner that I bought back in 2008 that you mentioned I bought a, an old small version uh, the one I'm using now is called the ix 500 and that's a, a big desktop model and that is a very popular scanner. If you go on Amazon, uh, you know, it's pretty universally good reviews. So I like I like that one. Uh, they have smaller versions of the ScanSnap as well. So there's one called the S1300i, which is kind of a good portable size, I guess I would say. It's kind of halfway between that and a truly mobile scanner. So somebody who wants a scanner that has what's called an automatic document feeder, which means you can take a stack of paper, throw it in the scanner, hit a button, and it will go through that stack versus having to feed documents in one by one. Uh, the S1300i and the iX500 have that. And they also scan both sides of the page at once, which is handy as well. And these are things that, again, it's not like you have to have that to go go paperless. But if you have a lot of paper to deal with, those features will reduce a lot of the friction, uh, a lot of the pain, uh, you know, it takes to actually go through this, this paper, it makes it a lot faster and easier. So, so that is the most common way is using a scanner, whether it's a desktop scanner or a small mobile scanner or whatever. 
But nowadays, actually, a lot of people have started using just their their phone or their tablet to, to scan documents. There's lots of really good scanning apps out there. Actually, I just had somebody email me a couple days ago and he told me that he was actually returning his scanner and it wasn't that there was anything wrong with the scanner, but he found for his needs, just using his phone was more than enough. Uh, so what people did originally when they were using their, their phones is they would just take a picture of the document which, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But a lot of these scanning apps, and if you're an Evernote user, Evernote has this ability built right in. Uh, but what these will do is they will actually clean up the, the picture. So you take a picture with, with your phone and it will clean it up and then, you know, save it as a, as a nicely formatted document. Uh, and, and by the way, Zach, uh, you told me to brain dump, so I'm just going to brain dump, <laughs> but anytime you want to stop me, just jump right in. <laughs> no, I, I'm realizing, um, uh, that it might be a lot to take in, but that's what the yeah. show notes are for. So that's why I was, I was just sitting here taking notes. Okay. For the gist, yeah. is a, um, luckily I'm relatively familiar with, uh, with a lot of the tools that you're talking about. And as somebody yeah. who I guess was born just late enough not to be overwhelmed by paper. I get right. all of my bills uh, paper, paperlessly, and mm. um, and I've learned over the years how to manage everything online a little bit more effectively. That the the mobile uh, ones work just well for me. Um, Scannable mm -hmm. is the one that I use for Evernote, and I believe Evernote owns that. And then Scanbot, I've heard a lot of people talk, say good things about. And the great thing about that is, rather than just the picture, is it it turns it into a a, a PDF image. That is then scannable for um, for words, which is is something mm -hmm. I imagine the Fujitsu and the other um, scanners have something called OCR uh, scanning, which will probably be important for the uh, the organize uh, section, which which I'm guessing. So um, yeah. so collect when uh, I did have a question with the collection. So we we got into the tools pretty quickly. Do you have any sort of suggestion for actually gathering all the papers? Do you just put them in a corner and just start going for it? Or do you review what needs to go into your system and, and throw out the things that don't need to go in first? Or do you have any suggestions around that? Yeah. Um, basically, the way I approach it is almost like a, a funnel. Uh, so, you know, you've you got a bunch of paper coming in. And what I'll do is a lot of it is just, you know, recycle. So I actually have my recycling bin near where the paper comes into the house so that a lot of it, you know, just hardly even gets into my life. Mm. So that can be a good tip if it if it works for you is just, you know, you don't have to have a big, ugly blue recycle bin, you know, you can use something that looks okay, and then just, you know, transfer the paper there. In my apartment complex, they put a recycle bin right next to the, the mail where I get my mail. Yeah. 80% mm. of it goes straight in there. So yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a nice feature. I didn't even think about that. Exactly. And so, uh, so, you know, you've gotten rid of some of the paper and then, uh, for the, what's left, you know, some of it is stuff I might want to read, but then don't necessarily need to keep. So then that, you know, I'll, I'll deal with. And then if I don't need to keep it, I'll get rid of it, either shred it or, or just throw it in the recycle bin, whatever, whatever works. And then for the, this is the way I personally do it. Different people do it differently. What I do is and the paper that is left, I have a folder in my thing right near my desk called to scan. And so any, anything I want to scan goes in there. And then once a week, uh, theoretically, uh, <laughs> I'll go through and uh, scan that folder and, and, and digitize it. And that that's, works pretty well for me because then you can kind of keep on top of it. I know how that theoretically goes. My, <laughs> I was doing pretty good with my physical impasse bit right now, but I'm looking at it and yeah, need some work. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and this, that's, that funnel sounds like a great system for once you've got things rocking and rolling. Uh, what about that, that first time, that first massive load? You've got a, you know, a box or two or three or five um, that need to be um, – need to be digitized what about people in those situations or or you're a small business owner that mm -hmm. uh that has maybe you're a dentist or a, a a lawyer and have just gobs of paper um what do you suggest there 
Well, you know what I would do first is I wouldn't start with the paper, the big backlog of paper that you have to deal with. Yeah. I would actually start with the new paper coming in first and get your system all nailed down, get your organization oh, yeah. set up, get get it so that you're comfortable with the system and you have all the kinks worked out with the new paper coming in because first of all, it's just less paper to deal with. So it's, it's kind of easier that way. Um, but also, and I mean, this isn't really the case in a dentist office, but it can be the case, you know, with somebody with their home stuff, there isn't that kind of emotional, uh, attachment and frustration that's baked into the new paper first. Mm. So you don't have that, that those kind of feelings that you might have with the backlog. Uh, so that's why I usually recommend getting everything going first with the new paper. And then with the, with the, you know, your backlog, yeah, I, there's different approaches, but I think a pretty decent approach is to go through and, and like you said, there's going to be a lot of that paper that you don't need at all. So you could go through and make an initial pass and just get rid of the stuff that you don't need to digitize. Because just because you've had something for 10 years doesn't necessarily mean you need to scan it. Uh, and then for what's left, there's different approaches. Some people like doing the, the newer stuff first because like kind of flip it around because it's more likely that the newer stuff is going to be more important. So that's what some people do, the different approaches. But one thing I will say is once you get going on this stuff, once you have your system down, it, it will be slow at, at the start. Uh, I, I will definitely admit that. But once you get kind of that muscle memory and those systems, uh, it actually goes very, very quickly. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's that, as soon as you said that, I was like, yep, that's the way to do it. Because then you have your folder structure set up. Then you have mm. maybe some naming conventions if you created those. Then if uh, I don't know if we'll have time to get into some of the tools that you could use, um, uh, you have some automations set up uh, to, to do things automatically for you. Um, so this, yeah, yeah, that's that's how you should do it. Follow Brooks' advice. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so you've, we've collected um, all, yep. all this paper. You've got this funnel to you. Before we go on to organize, is there any way to make that funnel a little bit tinier? And by that I mean any way to prevent some of the paper from coming into your world to begin with? Yeah, you can. what you can do is you can... There, especially for stuff like junk mail. Um, but first of all, f for a lot of these statements we have coming in from vendors and vendors and and uh, stores and stuff like that, a, in a lot of times you can, sh like you were saying earlier, shift it to digital. So you can just stop this paper from coming in altogether. Instead of them mailing you something, maybe you can get download a bill or something like that mm. down or download a document. And then for a lot of the junk mail and stuff like that, there are services and it depends where you live that you can contact and have them take you off all these various lists that you're on. It does take a bit of work to do for sure, but but uh, if that's something you want to do, it can be worthwhile. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's good. Just get, starting to move things to, to paperless would be your, your easy first win. And then uh, do you have a, a resource that's maybe the easiest for people to get on the, the do not mail list that you know of? Oh man, I, I can look at, how about this? Uh, I will, I do, I don't have it right in front of me, but I will look it up and you can put it in the show notes. Okay. How about that? We'll do that. <laughs> okay. So let's move on to the next step. So we're, we're starting to collect, we're start, starting to scan, we're starting to figure out our system, organize. How do we get going on that? Yeah. So there's really two keys to organizing. And the first is to have I would say a consistent and descriptive naming convention. So a certain way that you name your files. And, and the second is to have some sort of organization system that, that works well for you. Uh, for the naming convention, it doesn't have to be anything hardcore and fancy. Uh, I like putting the date in my file names. Not everybody does, but I personally like doing it. And then just something descriptive. Uh, Something, and I, I stole this term from someone I think you know as well. His name's Brett Kelly uh, from Evernote Essentials. He did this at a talk at an Evernote conference years ago, and I stole it from him ever since. And what he suggests when naming your files is to think of your future you. So in other words, 
when I'm, if I'm going to look for this document later, what are some words that I might use to look for it and make sure those words are in the file name? Because it's all about finding this stuff later. That's the whole reason we're filing it away, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once you have that naming convention, just do your best to name them and we'll touch on some tools that will help with this, but do your best to name it using that convention every time. And then just think of a, and again, it doesn't have to be complicated, just a simple high level, you know, category folder structure so that you know where each document should go. Can you give some examples of both those, the name and the, uh, the places where you, uh, folders that you might put the, uh, the various pieces of documents just so we have some yeah, sure. ideas. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, so for, so for a naming convention, uh, here in uh, Vancouver, where I live, our cable company, for example, is called Shaw. So for me, when I name my Shaw bill, I just call it date. So 2016-10-31 and then shaw.pdf. And that's a very simple naming convention. I always know to look for my bill. I could expand that if I wanted to. I could be more descriptive descriptive and I could say, you know, date dash Shaw cable if I wanted to be descriptive there. Uh, what some people do, and this is good if you're working on a, projects or with clients, they might put a code or a client number or something like that in the name as well. If it's a document that relates to a project or client, uh, because that way then they can use that code to find that document later as well. So that's what, something some people do. And the so folders? Is, and with the yeah, folder so the, structure? Yeah, so folders, um, you might have a category for, uh, well, here's one thing I, I like to do. When I'm scanning documents and downloading documents, I have a folder called Inbox. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to scan everything to that folder first and then move them to where they're going to go. Uh, that I find it a bit more efficient to scan in batches to a centralized folder rather than saving them one by one. And sadly, I actually timed it one time to see which would be faster. This is my life. This is how I spend my time. <laughs> and uh, so I found that it is, in fact, uh, more efficient to do it that way. Uh, but uh, other than my inbox folder, I might have folders for, say, I, I might call it vehicles for anything related to my vehicle or finances for, you know, things related to my bank and stuff like that. Um, I would have a clients folder and then some people might have a different folder for each client, uh, which is what I do. Or if you really want to be hardcore, you could just have it all in a general clients folder. I don't necessarily recommend that. Um, the key, though, is to not overthink it too much, because what a lot of people do will have layer upon layer upon layer. I can actually, for the show notes, I can provide some sample fo folder structures uh, that people can take a look at. Uh, That'd be great. Uh, yeah. So that they, so that they can see that, so they might find that helpful. Um, I know yeah. I did. I actually uh, used an image of the uh, the Asian efficiency folder structure this weekend mm. to organize my folder structure because it was like, oh, yeah. man, I know it was good. I know I yeah. understood it. So let yeah. me just not recreate the wheel and having some, yeah. a little something to go off of mm -hmm. was was pretty helpful. Now, as simple as is naming something the same way every single time seems people get lazy um people yeah. get forgetful <laughs> uh and people don't like doing that kind of stuff what are some ways to make this a little bit easier uh, to maintain over the long run yeah this is one area and you touched on it earlier uh there are some automation tools that can make this stuff a lot easier so one tool that's really helpful for naming files is called is a text expansion tool. So the one I personally use is called Text Expander. And what that allows you to do is create little snippets of text or codes. And so, for example, if I was saving a city MasterCard bill, what I might do is when I'm naming my file, I could call it, I could make a code something like CTX, let's just say, or CTXX or something. And when I type that, it will automatically expand it to be city, dash mastercard dash bill dot pdf 
So I don't need to remember, like you said, I don't need to remember every month, oh, you know, what format is my MasterCard bill? Mm -hmm. I just have to type CTXX, which becomes muscle memory very quickly. And it will do it for me the right way every time. And the nice so thing, too, is it, it probably yeah. even puts the date in there for you as well, I'm guessing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, it puts the date in as well. So that's that one. Now, so that is super handy. But if you have regular bills that you download or regular documents that you download or scan on a regular basis, you can go beyond this and you can use an automated organizer tool, uh, which you were mentioning earlier, Zach. Uh, one of them on the Mac is called Hazel. And then... Uh, uh, a kind of equivalent, it's not quite as good, not quite as fully featured, but there's one on Windows called Drop It. Uh, File Juggler is another Windows one. And what they will do is that allows you to watch a certain folder. So this is why I like scanning everything to my inbox folder. So it will watch a folder and you'll have set up rules for your various types of bills. And it will say something like, if I see a PDF in this inbox folder, and it contains the word Royal Bank of Canada, account number one, two, three, four, five, then I know it's my bill. What it will do is when it detects that, because I've scanned it or downloaded it, it will automatically rename it with my consistent and descriptive file name and file it away to my bills folder or whatever. So that way I know every month that it's gonna be named and filed it away properly. So these automation tools, are really, really helpful for taking a lot of that heavy lifting out of the paperless processing. Now, Brooks, you yes. still work in software development. Yes. I can look at you right now, you're wearing glasses. You, you talk <laughs> yes. about systems and funnels and workflows. Yes. Can the everyday person do this? Is, or is this something that, especially those last two tools that you mentioned, Text Expander, Expander and Hazel, are these user friendly enough or do I have to know code or something like that in order to use them? No, they're all they're all totally menu driven. Uh, you can get super geeky with these tools if you want to, but uh, I can attest to the fact just, you know, through the document snap community that lots of normals uh, do this stuff <laughs> and there's no there's no uh, you know, I have young people writing me that they do it and I have, you know, 80 year olds writing me that they do it. Uh, you know, anyone can do this stuff. You just kind of need to know how to do it. Some people need a bit more instruction than others, but this is not any sort of programming or anything like that. Okay. So it's not too difficult. But one question I wanted to ask you, because you even alluded to sometimes uh, already, and I don't know if you have a fresh story of this, uh, it's, it's very easy to get caught up in fiddling. When, when you start getting these types of tools in, in your warehouse, especially if you buy a new scanner or you download a new piece of software, it seems all fun and you, you can spend a lot of time uh, messing around with the settings without actually getting that return on your time investment. Do you have any advice for balancing building the systems as but not, but not messing around too much with it? Okay, I'm going to say what you should do, but it may or may not be what I always do. And I think you, you said it really well. So I think what you want to do when you're looking at automation is look at things that you that do take a lot of time to do. And if it is not too much setup, then something that will pay you back, you know, on a daily or weekly basis or monthly. So, for example, tech, using text exp something like Text Expander, one of these text expansion tools, is to me a total no-brainer because it avoids errors, which is one thing you want automation to do. It saves a lot of time, and it can be used for a lot of other things other than going paperless. Hazel also for going paperless, and neither of these tools are required so i don't want people to feel overwhelmed and feel like you have to set up these crazy automation tools there's absolutely nothing wrong with just doing it manually if that's what you're more comfortable with but they can have a lot of payoff there are things though that don't have as much payoff and so the two things i'll say so here's an example so the other day i for some ridiculous geeky reason, I wanted to have a way to convert uh, 
Gmail links into Mailplane links. Mailplane is an email program, <laughs> and it's there's it's just ridiculous. And so I did it in Text Expander, and it's something I thought would be really fast and easy, and it turned out it was not fast and easy. You know, there was a lot of just the way I was doing it. I was doing a lot of research and blah blah blah. It is something that I will do a fair amount. And so I'm kind of glad I did it. But if I'm honest with myself, there, I did not need to be spending the time that it took to do that. I don't think the payoff is there. So the advice I would give is if you are, if you start doing an automation project and you find that it's more complicated than you thought it would be, don't feel bad about pulling the chute. You know, uh, don't. You know, it's the whole sunk cost thing from my uh, management accounting background. Just because you've spent a lot of time doing something to a certain point doesn't mean you should con continue to spend time. So all to say, look at those high, high leverage, high value activities, but don't be afraid to pull the shoot if something is taking too long, which is not what I did the other day. But. <laughs> <laughs> or reach out for help. You can uh, talk to a coworker yeah, or reach or... out for help. Yeah. Go online, do some research, buy a, yeah. a course from you, um, which yeah. I will link to in the show notes because I just uh, did some multitasking and I found out it is still live. So yep. that is a, is a change my world with with Hazel. And, and Text Expander, I don't know if anybody really has a course out there on that. It's just it's a very simple, very effective tool that I have been using for, for three or four years as well and just gotten crazy amounts of value out of. Um, and naming conventions is just a small portion of the amount of snippets as they call it uh, that i have um that that just save gobs and gobs of time cool cool all right well thank you for 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 explaining how uh how you can avoid some of the mistakes that you, you've made in the past <laughs> um a big thing a big fear um and a big mistake people can make when going digital is not properly protecting it that could be mm -hmm. maybe not backing it up or not securing the the data. Can you talk about that stage of the paperless process? Yeah, to me, this is actually the most important part because you're right. A lot of times we'll we'll start going digital, but then we, you know, you always hear that you need to back up, but a lot of people don't do it. But it becomes super super critical if you are going paperless because you know hard drives die they they just do I, i'm sure a large portion of the audience listening to this will have had a hard drive dying at some point so fortunately both mac and windows have backup software built right in so there's really very little excuse uh, not to do it just pick up an external hard drive from you know costco or amazon or wherever plug it in they both have the system built right in on mac it's called time machine on windows it's called file history and uh, just set it up and it runs in the background automatically. So that's the first thing you should do. Uh, I personally like... Oh, sorry, and how, how does... Do you have to have the external hard drive plugged in for the Time Machine? Uh, to Or the, what's the Windows equivalent? Uh, file history, right. To be, be working for you? Yeah. Uh, the Mac uh, had some... Apple had something called Time Capsule, which you could plug. And there are there are drives that you can plug into your network as well. So if you don't want to have to plug something in, there are ways to do it. Apple has since announced that they're going to stop selling the Time Capsule, which is actually really unfortunate. But uh, the simplest way to do it is just to plug an external hard drive in. Uh, I personally like having at least two backups, though, one local, like I just talked about, and one off-site. So you, there's different ways of doing that, but the easiest way is to use some sort of online backup service. So what these do is, so you don't have to have anything plugged in, but they just kind of run in the background and upload your important files that you specify to these different uh, companies. I use one called CrashPlan. Uh, but another good one is called Backblaze, uh, and there's lots of other good ones as well. So just check it out and see which ones, if you want to use it, uh, work well for you. Because the good thing about these type of services is, if you think about it, this uh, like ignoring hard drive failure, but if something were to happen to your physical location, like a fire, flood, theft, whatever, if it's happening to your computer, it's probably happening to that external hard drive sitting right beside your computer. So ideally you want a copy away from your physical location as well. 
Yeah, and Backblaze is the one I use. It's super easy to set up, mm. and for just yeah. a couple dollars a month, you will you will have all that information. Especially if you're somebody who works a lot from their computer, it just it's mm. it's almost silly not to have something like that. And I didn't for years. I think it was only a year ago yeah. I started using one of those services. And yeah. <clears throat> another thing I do, uh, and I don't know if this is a bonus form of backup, maybe I'm doing really good, is I sync a lot of my documents to the cloud. I, I was using uh, Dropbox for a long time, and I just recently switched over to Drive, where I do a, a selective sync of information. So it, my hard drive automatically goes onto the, the servers for, in my case, Google. Is that uh, is that good enough? Is that an extra thing, or is that not necessarily backing it up is that not protecting it necessarily? yeah i wouldn't it's definitely good and it's it, it if you have your an, a local backup and that it, it, it's pretty good i i wouldn't rely on it as my only backup though because first of all it's not really designed for that and second of all the the good thing about these type of services is if something happens to a file in one location, it happens everywhere. You know that's the whole point of of these synchronization services. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so if something happens to say a file you have on Dropbox, maybe gets deleted off one computer, it will be deleted off of everywhere. A mm -hmm. And yeah, you know it, sometimes you can get them back, but not always. So I would personally. Uh, have that as part of your arsenal, but not rely solely on that. Yeah. I've had very good luck drop, Dropbox wise with revision history where mm -hmm. I've yeah. absolutely deleted something and then been like, yeah. dang it. And then found it again. Um, but not to say I've, that I've been lucky um, that you, you shouldn't do it because if you delete it and it's just on your hard drive, it really, it's gone. She gone. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it can be a lot of work that you put into something and just be like, no. Um, and then if you have a hard drive crash, oh my goodness. I've, again, I've been lucky and not experienced that, but that might be the, the pain that sets people to, uh, to do something mm -hmm. to set up a, a full system like this. Okay. Yep. So, so collect, organize, protect any other issues when it comes to protection. So we're, we're putting it up into these, uh, we, we've got our, our local hard drive and our external hard drive, which we can control. The the cloud backup that I talked about, and then the the actual backup service that you talked about with Backblaze, and um, oh shoot, what was the second one that you used? Uh, crash Plan. And Crash Plan, those are other companies uh, that may or may not have your best interest in heart. And, and Evernote is another tool that we talked about that actually was recently in the news about. Not uh, not necessarily being the best at keeping your private information private. How do you deal with that? Well, the first thing I would say is if there is something that you really, really, really would not want to get out, uh, I would say that is not a good ca candidate for uploading to the cloud. Uh, so there's ways you can definitely protect yourself. But if there's something that you would really be not happy if it got out, probably shouldn't go to the cloud in the first place. Uh, but um, aside from that, one thing you can do is choose a service that encrypts your data locally. So uh, a lot of these different services do now. I think Evernote is changing to be able to do that, but traditionally it hasn't. If you want to be extra careful, you could use a service where it encrypts it locally. When I say locally, I mean on their servers. But you can also have it so that you keep the encryption keys. So Crash Plan is one that allows you to do that. So even if they wanted to, this is what they say, who knows? I'm sure the NSA can get that no matter what. But, <laughs> but um, even if they weren't able to access the files, it, they still wouldn't be able to access the data inside the files because you hold the encryption key. So there's different services that allow you to do that. Um, as far as encrypting your hard drive goes, you can encrypt your entire drive. It's just a switch on your Mac called File Vault 2. So I personally turn that on, and I generally recommend people do as well. On Windows, certain versions of Windows allow you to use a tool called, or a feature called BitLocker. So uh, unfortunately, the home version doesn't provide that. But if you want to, you can upgrade to 
a higher version of Windows and turn that on. Or there are some free tools. I think Veracrypt is one on Windows that you can use to do that. And that way, if somebody were to get your hard drive, you know, steal it out of your trunk or whatever, uh, they would not be able to access the data on the drive. So that's something you can look to do. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I, this is I'm gonna have to listen to this episode a couple times to to dig <laughs> everything out uh, of there and, and make sure it all gets in the show notes. I'll, I'll probably have to follow up with you and ask you a couple questions. But this is exactly what I wanted. It's just a broad sweeping overview of best practices when it comes to taking that physical clutter and turning it into something that's that's effective, that's useful to you. Um, one thing that I want to point people to is your website, documentsnap.com forward slash get paperless cheat sheet. And there's little dashes in between all three of those things, but I'll put it prominently in the show notes so they could get the cheat sheet over at your site. If people want to find more about you or thank you for uh, sharing all your information, where is the best place to get a hold of you online? Yeah, you, like you said, you can just go to documentsnap.com. Um, there'll be a big button uh, that you can press to get the cheat sheet as well. Uh, so you can do that or you can find me on Twitter at uh, Brooks Duncan is probably the, the easiest way. That's my personal Twitter. Uh, and yeah, just uh, happy to hear from anyone. <laughs> just anyone. <laughs> <laughs> anyone. Oh, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, we'll just That's awesome. That's the Canadian <laughs> in you. Well, thank you, you again for, for coming on and um, look forward to uh, improving my paperless systems because I see some areas that I can uh, I can spiff up. So thanks again. Right on. Shout out once again to Brooks Duncan of Document Snap. And if you are interested in doing a paperless project, I'd encourage you to go to the show notes, ZacharySexton.com forward slash 13. Check out the links and resources put in there, including a wonderful ebook, a short ebook on the three steps, the collect, organize, protect that Brooks talked about. I have my new assistant who is amazing at graphic design, made up this ebook with all the links and resources mentioned. So whenever you are ready to do your paperless project, you will have a nice 12 page little, uh, little cheat sheet to do that in. And it also has links to some of Brooks's uh, resources in there as well to help you with that organization piece and the, uh, the collection piece. So thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next Wednesday for more 1% improvements. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Able Business Radio. Zach wants to help more small business owners like you make 1% improvements that add up to big results. Was this show helpful? Pay it forward. Subscribing and writing a review in iTunes is one of the best ways to help more people find out about the show. Thanks again for tuning in. We hope to see you here next Wednesday, where we will continue to share 1% improvements that will help you become a more useful, less stressed business owner.